Here's Goodnight Olive making her move to take the lead by a head around the far turn. Ray's Kane has nearly 10 lengths to make up. So does Scooby Guando, verifying the leader. Top of the stretch, Tappet Trice is coming on to the outside. Up to the mark is running late behind Master of the Seas. Set piece down the center of the course. Master of the Seas alongside Annapolis. Here's a Luce Princess coming after Maj and Mission of Joy tries to find room between that pair. Maj has the lead. Mission of Joy second, a Lucy Princess third. The champ in front. Good night, Olive chased all the way. Tappet Trice! Tappet Trice wins the Toyota Bluegrass. And welcome in, everyone. It's the Keeneland Look Ahead podcast. I'm your host, Jeremy Plonk from Horse Player Now. My 32nd meet with Keeneland. It's going back to the fall of 2008. And I went back and looked today. The opening day card that I covered in fall of 2008, one of the winners that day was Forever Together. And it seems like we've been forever together since uh, over the past 16 years. So the Kinlan look ahead, I believe in our third season of doing the podcast here with video style, we're going to go through the entire program for you from a handicapper's point of view. There'll be some news and some notes and certainly some betting strategies thrown around, but we want to get into the nuts and bolts of the handicapping here uh, and also talk about the strategy, how to look at the racing card. Some big changes at Keeneland for this upcoming spring meet. Of course, first post on Friday will be one o'clock. We'll be here each and every Pre-game night, if you will, 8.30 Eastern on the eve of every racing card. So when we have Wednesday racing, we'll start those on Tuesday nights. And again, 8.30 Eastern, you can check it out on X. You can check it out on Twitter, all the Keeneland handles, and also at Horse Player Now. And of course, pick it up in the archives anytime afterwards uh, at your convenience. We love having you along in the evening, but... If it's during the morning and you're getting ready for your handicapping before Scott and Gabby come on with today at Keeneland, that's great too. So we're happy to have you aboard. Uh, we will look at all 10 races on the opening day card. Weather is iffy. Rain overnight tonight. It's supposed to continue into the morning hours at Keeneland. 40% chance of showers throughout the morning. It's supposed to give way by the time we get the race time. So let's cross our fingers on that. But we could be looking at some wet conditions. We do have three turf races scheduled on uh well, four turf races scheduled on opening day. So uh, we will see if they stay on the grass or not. It is going to be chilly. There's actually some snow in the forecast, perhaps, in the morning. Uh, high temperatures, though, will reach the upper 40s, 47, 48 degrees uh, by mid-afternoon. So we're not going to have snow in the afternoon, but it could be a little bit in the morning when the horses are training. Keep an eye on the conditions. Again, Scott and Gabby, and, of course, the at Keeneland Racing handle on Twitter is where you're going to get your latest information uh, on social media. 16 days, the meet here at Keeneland, and we'll be with you for each and every one of those. Uh, let's take a look at how the card will shake out each and every day. We used to call this, uh, we had a different name for but we've mixed it up now and from the big picture we've turned to the snapshot so we're going to give you a look at all the races on the card in one overview and this will give you how the 10 race card shakes out at keeneland for opening day uh the races that begin with a multi-race wager will denote those we'll let you know where the turf pick threes are on every card where the stakes races are any carryovers that might come aboard so we've got 10 races on the program at keeneland pick five starts in race number one Pick four is going to start in the second race on the card. I'll give you three key plays of the day each and every show. My key plays are in the orange here in races four, five, and ten. We'll discuss those as we get to each race on the program. And uh, the pick six will start in race number five. One dollar pick six at Keeneland. That race number five is also going to start the Keeneland turf pick three. Remember, when we come off the turf, we'll still have a Keeneland turf pick three. Uh, we'll see if the races stay on the grass or not. That is the question that we'll have to all wait for uh, until tomorrow morning and get closer uh, to race time. Late pick five will start with the Lafayette stakes. It's the first of three stakes races in race number six. Late pick four opens in the seventh. The Transylvania stakes co-featured on the program as part of that turf pick three. The grade one Ashland, we got some wild stats for this one to talk about on the show. The Ashland is the feature in race number nine. And then we'll wrap things up with one of our key plays of the day. We've got two big prices at the end of the card. If we start off a little chalky on the program, don't get mad at me because I promise you, we got some prices in races nine and 10 to talk about. And of course, there's rolling daily doubles and rolling pick threes on every race on the program. And uh, the daily double is something I want to talk about now because the takeout for the daily double, which is the tax that's taken out of every bet in paramutual wagering, has been reduced from 22% down to 15%. So a seven-point cut 
in the takeout. Simply what that means is the winners in the daily doubles are going to get paid more than they have in past seasons at Keeneland and one of the lowest takeout rates you're going to see anywhere in a daily double wager. Of course, the daily double for our newbies is a winner in two consecutive races on the card, like a two-team parlay if you're talking about playing uh, in sports. But the daily double wagers with that reduced takeout become a wager you really want to focus on. So I'm going to give you some suggestions for the daily doubles and strategies and also some horses that I like on the card. I'm not the only one who handicaps here on the program. Uh, we also get the picks from the other handicappers and the handicappers consensus at Keeneland.com. It's a good resource for us not only to balance our opinions against, but to see where the heavy favorites might end up on a card. There are five handicappers in the Keeneland handicappers consensus to give you a quick look at the overview. And we'll go through each one of these races, not every line by line, but each race will go through Scott Hazel. Hamilton, of course, and Gabby Gaudette that you know from the simulcast feed. A uh, pedigree expert, Kim Nelson, has been with us in the handicappers consensus as long as I can remember. Uh, she's batting clean up on the end there. Tom Leach, of course, the voice of the Wildcats. Great long shot handicapper. Tom really comes up with some nice price horses uh, as the course of the season goes on. So keep an eye on anything Tom's got at a price. You give a second look at because he's had such good luck at identifying horses at nice prices. So uh, these are the handicappers. And when we're all agreeing on horses, you're going to see probably these horses are going to end up favorites, right? If public handicappers, four or five of them all agree on the same horse, it's probably something the public's going to dive into. On the converse, when we have races when everybody's spread out, four or five different horses picked on top, these are the great gambling races, right? Because if five public handicappers can get no consensus whatsoever, uh, that means you might be looking at a decent price play in those particular races. So that's why we go through it. I'll give you my opinions. And sometimes I look at the, the picks of the other handicappers on the consensus grid and I think, what did they see that I didn't? I'll go back and take a look at a horse or listen to their comments on the air uh, during the live show uh, to try to get a better sense of uh, why they like a particular horse that maybe I didn't. But I always love being on that island. You've heard that many times on this podcast in the past when I've got a horse picked on top that none of the other handicappers have. That's what I love it because I know I'm going to get a fairly decent price on those kind of horses. So without further ado, it's time to get handicapping here. If you are watching on the uh, feed uh, on YouTube and you want to put some comments in the channel, I'm doing everything here. I drive the bus. I talk. I'm doing it all at once. So I try to follow the comments here and there if I can. Sometimes I'll reply to them uh, after the chat and, and go back in and comment. Uh, if I can follow it during the course of the show, I'll catch a, a question or two and maybe take them on the air. But uh, let's get going here. Let's get handicapping. Race number one of the 2024 spring meet here at Keeneland starts off in Starter Allowance Company. It's about seven furlongs and it's a welcome back of sorts if you will rick dutro after his 10-year suspension of coming back to racing in 2023 he's back to keelan we haven't seen dutro win a race at keelan since court vision way back when i think it was about what uh I have it in my notes here somewhere, 2009, I believe, the last time, in the Shadwell Mile. So it's been a while for Rick Dutcho, but according to the handicappers here and myself included, I think he might come right back to the winner's circle. He's got one in here named Play Good, Pay Good, right from the rail, and I think this is the horse to beat in here. This one won for $50,000 when in the Rob Atris barn back in December at Fairgrounds. It's a starter allowance race, and a starter allowance simply means the horses can start in this race if they run for a particular claiming price or less. Well, this race has restricted the horses who have run for $50,000 or less. I want horses that ran for 50. I want them to have run for the maximum amount. And not only did they run for 50, but they won for 50. And that's what we're kind of looking at here with Play Good, Pay Good. Won a 50,000 maiden claimer at Fairgrounds. Now switches over to the Dutch Row Barn. And Dutro gets Irad Ortiz Jr. to ride. I mean, that just kind of has go written all over it. I don't think it's very creative. I think it's gonna horse is gonna get bet in here. Uh, and I think the one play good, pay good is probably gonna get the beat off to a chalky start in terms of my pick in here. Whether or not that's the winner or not, we're gonna find out. Uh, but I think the one should show a little bit of pace from the inside when this horse did fire, did show some early speed. From the rail, you want to get out there and go. Uh, seven furlong distance here at Keeneland. You don't want to be too far off the pace. How the track's going to play if it's wet, usually wet conditions favors horses towards the front uh, even more. Speed plays well in the slop as the horses behind. Don't like the kickback hitting them in the face. Some horses just resent it, and if they make the lead and they're running well over it early, they just have that early advantage and extend it. So speed in the slop, if we get a wet track, would be a good way to go. I think play good, pay good in the opener. Uh, the five in here, high fashion Kate's a horse that maybe can get a little bit of a price. Another one that I think can be pretty forward in here so maybe we can get the five in for an exact play as i look across the way for my other handicappers 
here. Uh, the ones picked on top for Tom, Scott, and I. The ladies have gone a different direction, though. The nine for Gabby Gaudette, the three for Kim Nelson. So uh, a little bit of uh, discrepancy there, but I think we're on the favorite. Uh, the one is the second choice for Kim and Gabby. So I think we're looking at a solid favorite, something maybe to five. You might be looking at nine to five, eight to five on Play Good, Pay Good. Uh, not wild about this one, and like I said, uh, don't get so upset here. If we've got some chalks early in the card, we've got some prices coming later and you got to take what they give you here at Keeneland. Some races, uh, we're going to see as we look at the profile of races at Keeneland, you know, some races are just really chalky. For instance, you get maiden special weights going long on the dirt and they win like 45, 46% favorites, a crazy percentage. Then you get races like the maidens on the turf and they went at 26, 27%. So, We'll talk about those different percentages. You can read that in my handicapping blog at keeneland.com as well. But know what's out there. Get a sense for what kind of races produce prices, what kind of sense of races are very trustworthy here at Keeneland. And that can help you to figure out when to take a stab because you're not going to be stabbing every race. I mean, look, favorites are going to win their share here at Keeneland. We've seen that over time. Which ones will, which ones won't. That's what we're trying to break down uh, and try to, you know, come up with an upset winner when we can. Uh, let's go to the uh, snapshot again. So the pick five is going to start in race number one. So race number two is where we're headed next. And this is a four and a half furlong two-year-old race you know this in the spring i call them baby dashes we talked about favorites having a good percentage in some kind of races well favorites win 51 percent of these races over the course of 77 of them held uh during the dirt era here at keeneland of course the dirt was reinstated back uh in time for the fall of 2014 meet so 2015 was the first spring back on dirt we've had 77 of these baby dashes you want horses who uh have workouts at keeneland 65 of those 77 winners were horses who had workouts at keeneland you don't want them coming off the farm or coming from another track get a little morning work over the track and of course it's all about wesley ward he's won 41 of these 77 races just an insane percentage uh John Hancock is the second most with nine. 41 for Ward, nine for the next most. And the third most trainer uh, in terms of two-year-old spring wins here at Keeneland, Mike Maker with three. So again, you're talking Wesley Ward, 41, John Hancock, nine. Mike Maker three. I mean, it's just it's insane. So you have to start your handicapping in these two year old races, obviously, with Wesley Ward. He's got two in here the nine Bostonian and the 12 Shoot It True. And as we go to the handicappers' uh, consensus grid across the way, we're all on Wesley Ward, right? It's just a matter of which Wesley Ward you want. Shoot It True, the top pick for Scott, Gabby, and Kim. Tom and I both have Bostonian. I'll tell you the uh, tiebreaker for me when trying to separate these two wards, a little bit better post position for the nine. Uh, we haven't had that many races with 11, 12 entries. You know, we talk about 77 of these races for the two-year-olds. There's only been 18 of them when there have been 11 or 12 horses in the field. And those outside posts have no wins in the 11 and 12 holes. Again, it's not a great sample, but it's tough to win out there. So uh, Shoot It True's got a little bit of extra work to do perhaps in here. Tyler Gaffleone rides. Gaffleone has ridden really well in these baby races over the years. So, uh, you know, Shoot It True could very well be the winner in here. But I'm going with the nine Bostonian with a little bit better draw. And we've seen with Wesley Ward, do not let the jockey assignment throw you off here at Keeneland. One, he changes riders a lot from who's named. But a lot of times it's his B rider. Like when he rides Alvin Jimenez, they're like seven for 10 together. It's insane in these two-year-old races. So just don't look at a big name rider like Tyler Gaffleone on Shoot It True and think for sure that that's Wesley Ward's ironclad horse in a particular race. He'll... You know, he'll fool you with who he puts on jockeys. Speaking of Alvin Jimenez, he's on the five in here in race number two, Jet Sweep Joe. I threw that one in there third in my picks because, again, Jimenez, seven for 10, teaming with Ward. He's 10 for 20 in these baby races overall, so he's three for 10 for other trainers as well. So Alvin Jimenez does a nice job in these dash races uh, uh, coming around the hook there and uh, to the wire. So I gave the five Jet Sweep Joe a little bit of love in there. But, again, we start the early pick four as we go back here to the uh, snap shot of the card this is the second race of the pick five it's the first leg of the early pick four you don't want to go more than two deep in here settle on the two wards preferably pick one or the other and wesley will scratch a lot of times with one of his two in these uh baby races as well so don't be surprised when the scratches and changes come out if the nine or the 12 is gone then you just lean on the other ward in this particular spot i'm not going to try to fit a square peg in a round hole and pick against the guy who's got a 41 nine lead in the standings uh in two-year-old races just not going to do it
Let's go to race number three next up. And there are no wagers opening in race number three, but this is our first turf race of the meet scheduled. Now, I got to say, if we're going to have a race come off the turf because of the weather on Friday's card, this is probably the one. A couple of reasons. We got to stakes a little bit later, but this is a turf sprint. And turf sprints generally come off the turf faster than route races do because the gates on the back stretch, the horses are spread out. That's usually a really big field size, and they rip up a lot of course. There's a lot of divots, uh, the whole back stretch, you know, horses seven, eight wide down the back stretch. We're in a route race. By the time they get on the back stretch, they're really what, two, three path, and they just kind of go single file and double file down the back stretch and don't tear up near as much of the course. So if we're going to lose one of the races on the turf on Friday, probably race number three would be the one. There are some good options in here. There's only nine entered for a turf sprint, uh, one for the main track. The 10 Bushido would go on the main track if they run uh, on the main. I went with the one in here, Counter-Strike, coming off the races at Turfway. I thought it was being cute. I thought it was a little bit of inside uh, uh, pace versatility, a horse who kind of doesn't have to be to the front but won't be way back. But then I saw the handicapper's consensus grid, and I thought, you're not very creative, punk. <laughs> Counter-Strike picked on top by Scott, by Gabby, and Kim as well. Four of the five of us ended up on the same horse. I don't know if Counter-Strike's going to be favored or not for trainer John Enos. Uh, you know, you got some other horses in here with some class and some bigger name Barnes uh, than what we have here. So maybe we can get a better price than the handicapper selectors box tells me. But uh, if four or five of us are all in the same default top pick in here, I thought there were good options. And I was, you know, trying to find one around five, six to one. I don't think I'm going to get that. So let's just see and shake out what the prices look like uh, on the tote board here. Average winner in a turf sprint allowance race like this is about seven to one. So you do not have to settle for a short price in race number three. If counter strikes bet down too low, the nine BD Valeski becomes one I like in here. Uh, this is a, a jockey Tyler Gaffleon who rides the turf sprints at Keeneland really well. He's about 50% in the exact. And when we get fields like this nine less, and they become jockeys races in the turf sprints more than those big fields, which are just mad dashes. When you can think about it and there's a little cat and mouse going on in a turf sprint, Tyler Gaffleon is really good. 49% in the exact with nine or less horses in a turf sprint. So the nine BD Valeski, uh, one that I'll keep an eye on there in uh, race number three. Let's go to the fourth race and uh, go back to the uh, snapshot and see what we've got cooking here. One of my key plays on the card here. We talked about the daily double wagers, and this is something you want to focus on with that 15% takeout. Uh, you're going to get more back on your winning tickets. I think the seven in here, neat trick, is an absolute standout. And I'm going to try to get this horse home in some daily doubles starting off across the board with their other handicappers here in race number four. I'm the only one with neat trick, which I'm surprised because I kind of think this horse is going to get bet, but Gabby's got the horse second. Scott's got the horse second and nobody else has neat trick in the top three. I love this horse in this particular spot. Luis Saya, superb in seven furlong races at Keeneland, a specialist distance for horses, but also a specialist distance for jockeys in here. He's got a dollar thirty-one ROI, which means for every dollar you bet, you get a dollar thirty-one back. Thirty-one percent profit betting Luis Saya in seven furlong races at Keeneland. That's money to me. A neat trick is by Good Magic, the sire. Of course, Good Magic was a bluegrass stakes winner, but last year, uh, Good Magic sired horses who won 31% of their races, five for 16 on the main track at Keeneland. So I love the pedigree. I love the rider. Neat trick coming out of races at Gulfstream Park where he was knocking on the door. I just think it's a slam dunk for me. Neat trick, one of my best bets of the day. Hopefully we can get three to one or so since no one else is picking the horse. I thought the horse would be solidly favored. Everybody else is kind of trying to find something maybe and get a little bit cute in here. We'll see the nine Bells Beach, a horse by Curlin, $675,000 uh, facing Tipton purchase. I don't know if Bell's Beach is going to take money as a first time starter, but I prefer my horses to have some experience uh, in these kind of races going seven furlongs, uh, first time starters. So uh, Bell's Beach, uh, I'll let that one beat me if he's good enough uh, to do so. If she's good enough to do so, of course, you always have to respect Irad and Chad when they team up in here. Hopefully that one takes some money, but needs a race and, and isn't quite up to the uh, seven furlong test. Uh, let's go back to the uh, snapshot here as we go for race number five. So we've got our key play in race number four, right? Is a key play a horse who's two, three to one to bet the win? Not necessarily with neat tricks. So I'm looking at the daily double 
And because we've got a 12 horse field in race number five, I'm hoping this race can stay on the turf. We've got a big field of 12 in here. This is an upset category of races. So I'm trying to get a key play for me to races four to five, because I've got a horse I love in race number four. I don't think he's going to be a huge price to bet the win. But in race number five, we've got a big field size, and we've got the best profile for long shots at Keelan of any division of races. Turf route maiden special weights. Favorites win just 24.9%, less than 25%. Average winner in these races is almost 7 to 1 odds. So you can price shop a little bit in race number 5. And the key to these maiden specials on the turf and the spring meets has been Gulfstream shippers over the years. I'm looking for the Gulfstream horses to do it again. And a mile on 3 16th, the class should come out. And there's a handful of Gulfstream horses in here, three of them that I'm going to use in my key plays. The 11 Swans Cove, the 10 Talonade, and the 2 Spinning Class. So it my key play of the day as we go back and we look at races four to five, we're going to look at that uh, top pick number seven, neat trick in the daily double in race number four to the 11, 10, and two in race number five. I'm going to take all three of those golf stream horses and try to bank on one of those getting to the winner's circle and look at the names of the, uh, of the trainers here. Mott, Motion, and McGahey. You got the 3M, if you will, of Keeneland Turf Trainers. That's pretty darn good. Mott, Motion, and McGahey. Uh, on the turf at Keeneland in a mile on 3 16th. I feel good about one of those three punching at home. I don't think any of the three necessarily has to be the favorite in this particular spot. There'll be some other horses who might take a little bit of action in here. So let's hope that we can get a little bit of a price here on one of those three and get the biggest of the three home uh, amongst my key plays of the day in a race number five. Again, now if this race comes off the turf, now we're kind of like searching around here in a different ball game, right? Now you're looking for horses who are uh, main track only types. There's nobody entered main track only. And if you look at the running lines in the form in race number five, there's not a lot of, uh, you know, any dirt form to speak of. They're all horses who have run on synthetic or turf or the first time starter Capodano down on the rail. I wouldn't want a first time starter going that far from the rail. Uh, so look, you have to completely just toss, toss the race and you're not looking at a key play if this race comes off the turf. But again, on the turf, we're looking at the 11, 10, and two, all horses that I think have a big, big chance in race number five. Okay, to the sixth race we go next up, it's the Lafayette Stakes, the first of three stakes races on the card. It'll also kick off the pick five. Forgot to mention in race number five, that's the first leg of the pick six. The Keeneland Turf pick three will also start there. Pick six, a $1 bet at Keeneland with the carryover provision, not a jackpot bet. Traditional pick six, but a $1 minimum. The Keeneland Turf pick three is a $3 bet, so... Low takeout on that, but a $3 minimum on the Keeneland Turf Pick 3. You can expect a couple hundred dollars in returns on those Keeneland Turf Pick 3s when you take those down. Sixth is the Lafayette. Kicks off the late Pick 5. We'll include three stakes races there. The Lafayette Stakes is a seven furlong sprint for the three-year-olds. And I think we've got a future star in the sprint ranks here. Number one, Doncho, or number three, Doncho. Uh, number three in the program, number one to the winner's circle, hopefully. Uh, Doncho, my top pick, as well as Scott's in here. Michelle Lovell trains back-to-back -back big efforts at fairgrounds. This one has gone nine and changed twice in six furlong sprints. Brought up the right way, you know, the maiden race, then to the allowance. Now they go to a listed stakes. There wasn't this urge to just throw to the wolves right away. And I think that's good, savvy training by a trainer, Michelle Lovell, who's not one to run horses in all the big races around the country. She's going to have to have horses who sustain their careers and, and run well into their, you know, elder years in her barn. If she's going to be successful as a trainer, she doesn't just get you know, all the top six figure horses every year at the yearling sales, replenishing her stock every two, three years. So uh, Michelle Lovell's taking good care of Doncho to this point, And I think this horse has a big, big future. Now he's going to have to be a runner because Booth is good in here. And Booth is also the top pick for Tom and Gabby in this spot. Booth is my second choice. And then Glenn Gary's in this race, a horse who won a stakes race here, the Bowman's Mill. Last year, again, we talked Luis Saez, really good seven furlong pilot. Uh, there's a lot to like about Glenn Gary. This is a good race, but I think Doncho could be a great horse. And a great horse wins uh, against this competition, I think. Although there is respect for Booth and Glenn Gary in this particular spot. I love the six in here. I think this is a horse that you want to try to get to in daily doubles. Races five to six, we talked about. You know, using those three horses in race number five, the 11, the 10, and the two, we were matching them up with the single in race four. We're going to match them up with the single in race six as well. So you want your daily double in this spot, 11, 3, 10, 3, and 2, 3 from races five to six. And I think Don chose the one to beat here uh, in race number six, the Lafayette Stakes. 
Seventh race on the card starts the late pick four, and the pick four is on Friday of a $200,000 guaranteed pool. So pick four action getting underway uh, in the seventh as we get a little respite from the stakes races late in the card. This is a six and a half furlong allowance sprint in this spot. Uh, I went with Wesley Ward and Sam's Treasure. This horse is coming off a layoff. That's not that big of a deal. You know, we study the profiles of these horses at Keeneland. There are some particular races where horses coming off long layoffs have a history of running very well. Allowance sprints like this is one of them. We've had 20 of them at six and a half furlongs here in the database. Eight of those 20 winners, going back to the beginning of the uh, return to dirt, eight of those 20 winners were making their first start of the year. Last year, we had five such races like this. Three of them were won by horses making their first start of the year. So fresh horses off layoffs come back ready to roll in these kind of races. Uh, so I'm not afraid of the layoff with number four, Sam's Treasure. You get John Velasquez, Wesley Ward teaming up in here. Uh, potent connections. I think he'll be ready to go. Gets the LASIK. So I'm on the four in here, Sam's Treasure. Now, there's an interesting horse in here. If you uh, were here uh, for October 15th at the fall meet, you saw the biggest long shot to win at Keeneland since at least the beginning of our database back in 2006. That's Cozy Rags, the one. Debuted a winner at 88 to 1 odds. Again, the longest shot winner we had since I helped create the polycapping database. And of course, it's just the Keeneland handicapping database now because the poly track's gone. But we created that database in the fall of 2006. Uh, dating back to the fall of 2006, when I came aboard in 2008, we retrofitted it to the races that had already been run. No horse was a bigger long shot than Cozy Rag. So if you want lightning to strike twice, he doesn't owe you anything. But I just thought that's an interesting nugget to throw out there on Cozy Rags. I don't think he wins this particular spot uh, coming out, or she does, uh, coming out of some stakes races uh, at uh, Turf uh, Turfway. Uh, she does drop in class a little bit into the allowance company. But horse for course at Keeneland is a real thing. It's as real as any racetrack in America. So you're not going to get 88 to 1 probably again, but... Cozy Rags, an interesting one to talk about here, at least uh, in the seventh race. Let's see who the other handicappers have in the first leg of the late pick four. Uh, this is one of those races with not a lot of agreement in here. You got two for Roswell. You got two for Legoderma. And I've got Sam's Treasure in this particular spot. Uh, nobody else has Sam's Treasure in the top two except Kim. Scott's got a top three pick in there. So we might get a middling price here. We might be looking at a nice four or five to one on Wesley Ward, John Velasquez, horse coming in fresh, like all of that, uh, like every bit I hear about that. Roswell, certainly some respect for that one coming off a second place finish at Gulfstream last time. Could be a big opening weekend for Bill Mott. I think he's got a shot to win a couple of races here. Uh, it's into mischief, a coma. What a great pedigree. A coma was so good here uh, at Keelan back in the poly track era. Roswell comes out of a race when running second to launch, who came back to win the any limit stakes at Gulfstream in her next start. So she comes out of a good race. 4, 10, and 9 away. I've got them lined up here in race number 7. Again, the 3 gets some love from my handicapping brethren. And number 10, Roswell, obviously, uh, gets some love as well. Okay, let's go to the 8th race next on the card. And this is our second of three stakes races. It's also the second leg of the Keeneland Turf Pick 3. Race number 8 is the Transylvania Stakes for 3-year-olds on the grass at a mile and a 16th. Uh, we've got uh, a horse in here named Musical Act coming in for the first time from overseas. Charlie Appleby trains this Godolphin color bear. Frankie Dettori, the world-renowned rider, he won two races here during the spring 2023 meet. Dettori's back in town to ride Musical Act. Tom Leach, the voice of the Wildcats and of Keeneland Select, uh, he caught up with the assistant trainer for Musical Act earlier this week and gave us a little bit of intel on this runner. Here's Chris Durham, assistant trainer for Musical Act, the starter here in the Transylvania Stakes. Chris Durham is the assistant to trainer Charlie Appleby for the Godolphin string here at Keeneland. Let's talk about uh, Musical Act in the Grade 3 Transylvania presented by Keeneland Select. and. Uh, what you like about uh, what you've seen out of him preparing for this race? He's done really well. Um, he's eating, drinking very well, and um, Salim Golem, who rides him, is very happy with him. He did a little blow this morning, um, which will be his last bit, um, and hopefully we can uh, do the business on Friday. In the condition of the turf course, uh, not really a big concern if it's a little off for. I don't think so, but we know on Friday, you know, um, we didn't. We we wanted to get on it yesterday, but obviously the with the wet, the way the weather was, we couldn't get on it. Um, you all walked it and thought it was pretty firm. We all thought we thought it was okay, yeah, to go on, um, but obviously the weather, you know, and we couldn't get on it. But we, we had a look at this morning; it looks okay. It's uh, it can dry out here. It is. Uh, 
when he's at his best, musical horse, a musical act, uh, what do you see in, in this horse? What uh, is something that's an indication that he's at his best? Um, look, he's um, he's a progressive sort of horse. The, the team was happy with him in Dubai. Um, uh, he improved, and and we're hoping for a good run. And you. Uh, uh, as far as his personality or just his physical makeup, anything that's changed from last year to this year? Well, he's, he's been gelded, so um, that can bring him forward from being gelded. Um, so, yeah. Uh, can, that, it, can it kind of calm some horses down? It calms the horses down, and he, he seems well chilled now, um, where before he can, he was a bit of a cold, you know, a bit of a lad, so he's doing well. Thanks to Tom Leach for that extra intel. You can go to the YouTube page, the Keeneland official YouTube page, and get all of Tom's interviews throughout the meet. We'll try to work those into the podcast here when we can. Also, Jenny Reese from the Kentucky Horsemen's Association, the Kentucky HBPA, has done some good interviews. We're going to get some her input uh, from her interviews coming up a little bit later in the show. I was also able to look at a couple of the questions in the chat while that was rolling. Got a chance to catch my breath and see some of your questions. Please stand by. I'm going to answer some of those here in just a bit after we give you the handicap capping insights here uh, for the eighth race, the Transylvania Stakes. Uh, Transylvania Stakes has a uh, stakes field here. We'll get a look at uh, the full lineup of 14 entered in here. Uh, one also eligible runner. Uh, you got horses coming from all over. You got musical act from overseas. You got Lord Bullington coming in from California. You got horses coming north. Uh, you got horses coming from all over uh, south. Uh, they're, they're coming from all over the country and around the world uh, for the Transylvania Stakes. I landed on number six, First World War. This is the son of Warfront. Uh, Warfront had four winners on the turf last year at Keelan, uh, 24% win rate. They do well here. Brendan Walsh won five races at the spring meet on the turf last year uh, here at Keeneland. That tied for the most amongst any trainers. And this horse is coming in with a bullet workout here at Keeneland. So first World War, the six, is going to be my choice in the uh, Transylvania Stakes. And as we look across the way to the other handicappers here on the uh, board, uh, let's see. We've got uh, race number eight. We got Laganos, the three picked on top. We've got the six, the one, the nine, and the ten. This is a classic race where we've got Spread City, five different handicappers, five different horses on top. This is going to be one of those races that you're going to be able to get yourself a price uh, if you're diving into this race. So check out uh, a, a nice price play if you can sink your teeth into one here. And you certainly want to spread when you're looking at the multi-race wagers, not one uh, where you're going to knuckle down and focus on a particular horse or two. Unless you have a strong opinion, then you can separate yourself from the public. But when we're talking pick fours and pick fives and the various wagers that are going on late in the day here in race number eight, including the Keeneland Turf pick three, Knock on wood, if we're going to have a race that stays on the grass on Friday, this would be the one. You want to try to keep a graded stakes on the grass at all costs when you can, as long as safety is an issue, not an issue. Uh, so the Transylvania Stakes, uh, this is a race where people are going to have to use multiple horses in this particular spot, I think. And uh, again, our five public handicappers have five different horses picked on top in this particular spot. So good luck, handicappers. I'll try to help you out a little bit with the one I've got on top in there. Uh, but this is not one of these races that is uh, super confident uh, for any of us in the uh, public handicapping realm. Uh, let's get to some of these questions in the chat here quick uh, as we take a look at uh, some of the uh, information you guys have put in the uh, comment section. Again, if you're watching on YouTube, uh, be sure to fire in some uh, comments as well. Uh, people asking about whether or not we're going to be on the turf again. We'll have to wait and find out uh, for tomorrow. But uh, uh, Tom was asking here in the chat, uh, do you watch a few races on opening day to see how the track is playing? Yeah, I mean, generally, the, the earlier races on a card usually aren't that attractive from a betting standpoint. There's a reason they're moved up to the front of the card. The racing office sees what's in and, you know, a smaller field size, a heavy favorite. Those kind of races generally get pushed up towards the front. So those are races I'm not super involved in in gambling on anyway, right? We got the Wesley Ward low priced horse in race two. Those two year old races are almost always first or second race on the card. We got a smaller field in race number one with the Dutch or horse. It'll probably be a favorite. So you get a chance to watch those races and not invest much generally on most days of the week anyway at Keeneland because they're not the best betting races. So by the time you get into that third, fourth, fifth, sixth race on the card, you get a little bit more sense how things might be playing. Keeneland plays the speed unless 
the track has been too fast. That's usually when Keeneland doesn't play to speed, it's because it's been really fast on previous days. And the maintenance crew comes in there and says, we got to slow it down. So then they'll kind of, you know, dig things up a little bit, slow it down because you don't want it too fast because it's not safe for the horses. So generally when you see a slow track at Keeneland, it's in response to the races that were really fast. And so that's not going to change during the course of a day. That's going to change from day to day. And if all of a sudden you're used to seeing races in 110 for six furlongs, they're now going 111, 112. You say, okay, this track was really slow. And when it slows down, then maybe horses from off the pace and the stamina kicks in a little bit more. One of the big things that came to when it comes to quote unquote, how the track is playing is the wind. You folks who have been there many times know it sits up on the hill in the field and the wind comes whipping through there. You can't emphasize this enough. Flags to the left, which means a, a back a stretch tailwind at their back on the stretch and going down the back stretch with a tailwind. Flags to the left favors speed. Those horses get their early lead. They don't exert as much energy to do so. When they turn for home and the wind hits everybody in the face, nobody runs into it. The closers are just as discouraged as the horses up to the front. And the front runners got their early fractions, got the coast. And they take the lead into the stretch and they don't stop. So flags to the left plays the speed, flags to the right. Now the front runners have to run into the wind as they're going down the back stretch. And when they're supposed to be opening up their easy lead, they're working harder to do it. And then they run out of steam. And then when they turn from home, they all have the wind at their back. I'm tired. The horse behind me's got the wind at his back as well. And he's not tired. All of a sudden you get past in the stretch. So keep an eye on the flags at Keeneland as much as you are the racing surface itself. But yeah, I mean, could you watch a race or two and see how the track's playing? Just assume 75% of the time it's going to play to speed. That's just Keeneland. That's the way that it is. Uh, and adjust, you know, if you see horses just dying on the front end, running out of steam on the front end, uh, then you can make that kind of uh, assertion in there. Uh, who do you think will have a great meeting as a trainer that is under the radar? Cherie DeVoe, uh, she doesn't run that many, but the horses she has had at Keeneland in recent years have been awfully good, and she's a high-percentage trainer, uh, but her horses will be well-meant. Um, as you get a little bit later in the meet, there's always a couple sneaky trainers that come along towards the end of the meet that have some horses that weren't thought of earlier in the meet. Mike Tomlinson comes to mind. Uh, he'll have some horses later in the meet when the competition gets a little easier that sometimes they sneak by at a price. A Drury does the same thing. Uh, with horses a little bit later in the meet. So uh, those are a couple names there that aren't, you know, at the cusp. But leading trainer in Keeneland should absolutely come down to Wesley Ward, depending how many two-year-old races there are, and Brad Cox. It's it's theirs. And in terms of the leading jockeys, you got Gaffleon and Saez. They've won every riding at title at Keeneland probably for the last six, seven years without fail. Uh, it's one of those two. And if I had to tell you right now, I'd say Saez would uh, outdo Gaffleon. Tyler just hasn't been riding as great the past couple of weeks. I didn't think he had a good ride uh, in the Arkansas Derby last week. And, and so Saez might be coming in in a little bit better mental state right now than Gaffley on the way he's been riding lately. And Keelan's a short meet. You get off to a fast start and that's all it takes uh, uh, to, you know, get on all the good horses. And of course, uh, uh, you know, Saez has uh, Kira McLaughlin, his agent, uh, does a good job getting him on the good horses anyway. So uh, I wouldn't see uh, any difference in the jockey standings. I think you're going to look at those two. Depends how long I rat Ortiz rides and how many mounts he wants to take. He could certainly be uh, in there. Uh, Keith asked a question about uh, what tracks do horses come from that do well at Keeneland, meaning like turfway horses, etc. cetera. Uh, when they come here, we talked about it already. On the grass, the Gulfstream horses are obviously the strongest. Fairgrounds is getting a little bit better with that, and Gulfstream's getting a little weaker than they have been historically. They're running less turf races at Gulfstream over the last year or two with the uh, installation of their synthetic course. You don't get as many good horses from uh, Gulfstream as you used to. Fairgrounds used to kind of be like, a, eh, they're not going to win on the turf, but here and there, they're starting to get a little bit better in that result. Tampa Bay Downs horses do better here than you would expect. Uh, I think that's a decent spot uh, to look for some horses, uh, you know, in, in some of the lesser ranks, but, uh, you know, in, in stakes too. I mean, we've seen horses out of the Tampa races and the bluegrass do well, but the Tampa Bay Downs horses do fairly well. Um, the, the Turfway horses were better last year than they have been in some others. Again, you're looking for the right classifications there. The Turfway horses don't run well on the grass, it seems like, at all here at Keeneland. But on the main track is where you're looking for the Turfway horses uh, on the cheaper levels. So, you know, you get down to the starter allowances and the claimers. Then the Turfway horses on the main are quite effective. So that's where you want to look for those horses. Uh, and so let's get back now to uh, race number nine. Uh, next up on the card here, I've got to click around a few little spots to uh, uh, 
uh, find our schedule. Uh, race number nine is up next on the card. It is the grade one Ashland Stakes, and uh, we've got a, a nice field of three-year-old fillies here, including the one, two, three finishers in last year's Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies. Just FYI, Jody's Pride and Candy, they're all back. Now, we haven't seen two of them since last year, including Just FYI. She's had some illness over the course of the year, and trainer Bill Mott admits he's playing a little bit of catch-up. We talked about Jenny Reese, the former legendary turf writer, now working for the Kentucky HBPA in their communications department. She caught up with Bill Mott. Let's take two minutes with Bill Mott here and hear about the champ, just FYI. Just FYI, the two-year-old Philly champion, unbeaten, untimely temperature. She spiked before the Devona Dale, and you had to regroup with her. Right. Well, we were forced to scratch out of the Devona Dale. She developed a fever on race day. I mean, it wasn't something that we had any suspicions of or any thoughts about uh, before the race or before shipping down to Gulfstream. But, you know, as the as the day went on, our temperature went up and, and by noontime we decided to scratch. And did you immediately start thinking about the um, Ashland? Or are you well, thinking about we, the we already Gulfstream know about those things. I mean, we know what races are available and what the options are. And you, but number one, you hope that you know, she gets over the virus that she had, and and uh, you know we were lucky enough to get her back actually on track in a in a week's time. Had her back galloping and breezing, and we've got a couple breezes in her. And you know, would I prefer to have another breeze in her, or breeze or two, before we run? Probably, I, I, ideally. But uh, if you're working backwards from the Kentucky Oaks, and you have any any visions of that in your mind you know you've got to go ahead and get a race in her so uh we're we think she's doing well and we're going to run on saturday uh but um you know i think the the main thing is you know naturally we'd love to win the race but we do need to get a race in her before we before we think about the kentucky oaks physically has she changed much from two to three well she was a big scopey filly at two and and she's probably grown a little i look at her every day so I probably don't see it as much as somebody that hasn't seen her, but yes, I think she's grown. I think she's stretched out a little bit and filled out some. Sense a little cautious optimism there? That's certainly how I read it. You've got to read the tea leaves when you're talking and listening with trainers. Obviously, they don't want to say anything that sets their owners off. That's who they work for. They don't want to mislead the betting public in many cases. Uh, but Bill Mott seems a little tempered there, right? And temperature being the problem with just FYI, or just FYI earlier this year. I'm inclined to bet against her on Saturday or on Friday because it's a tough spot. There's some good horses in this particular spot. And folks, the Ashland has just been bonkers. That's the bottom line to it. Listen to these winning prices in the Ashland Stakes in recent years. This isn't the poly track era and the craziness. This is the dirt era. 2019, 52 to 1, out for a spin. 2016, 30 to 1, weep no more. 2017, 22 to 1, Sailor's Valentine. And last year, 20 to 1, Defining Purpose. That's four winners of this race since 2016 at 20 to 1 or more. This race has been off the rails way more times than it's been formful. I'll take my chances with another price. And folks, I've got a big price in the Ashland Stakes. Let's swing the bats with a 30 to 1 morning line standout sensation. I knew when I picked her, I'd be on the island. I felt pretty good. And there is nobody else uh, going to this island. Look, I know Impel is super strong. Uh, she's going to step up in class, but she looks like the real deal for trainer Brad Cox. She's the top pick for Scott, Tom, and Kim. I will not be shocked if she wins this race. We're all picking against just FYI. I'm not going to use her in my top three because I think there's some other options in here that are more recent or have not had the setbacks that she's had. If she wins this race, she's a champion, no question about that, and she's going to go on to the Kentucky Oaks and be formidable in that particular spot. But Brad Cox already has Tarifa, who won the Fairgrounds Oaks last week, as the favorite for the Kentucky Oaks right now. He could have the second choice, Impel, and have a powerful one-two punch if she's able to win here in the Ashland. But again, this race has been pothole central uh, for short prices over the last several years, and big prices have run roughshod. Now, why do you end up on standout sensation? Because I mentioned that Philly Tarifa, right? 
Tarifa right now would be four to five in the Kentucky Oaks, unless just FYI or Impel do something spectacular in the Ashland Stakes on Friday. You are looking at Tarifa as a four to five shot in the Kentucky Oaks. Standout sensation, two starts back in a lounge company, led deep into the stretch at fairgrounds and got beat three quarters of length by who? Tarifa. She's got some quality about her. She's a former maiden claimer. Tom claimed her for $100,000 off of Brett Calhoun last November at Churchill. And now you're going to say, well, how's she going to win the Ashland Stakes? The recipe to win this race is to be up near the front. Almost all of those big upset prices. Last year, we came from off the pace with the McPeak horse, but almost all those other big upsets where horses were near the front uh, in the Ashland Stakes. Post two to the inside. Advantage. Blinkers on. Advantage. This is the filly who's got a little early speed. She did not break last time. And the fact that she didn't break last time and rallied to run second helps her price in here. Look, I know she's taking a big step up on class. But the mile and the 16th races have a very short run to the first turn here at Keeneland. They also finish at the 16th pole finish line. So it is two advantages to inside speed. It adds up to me. I'm going to take a shot at standout sensation. Look. Is she as good as these other horses on credentials? Absolutely not. She's never been in a stakes race, and you've got the top three finishers in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies running here. But we've seen it before in this race, and we're here to gamble. So we're going to gamble, and we'll see what happens. Uh, hopefully everybody out there gets a little piece of her, but not too much, because I still want to get somewhere in that ballpark of 25 to 1 or so. And I don't think even if everybody on the podcast goes and believes me, which I don't think many of you will, uh, but if we all go in on standout sensation, I still think she's going to be a fairly big price because there's just – too many other good options to choose in this race for the masses to fall into her. I'm on an island with the pick. I think she's going to be a price. I have a ton of respect. I think Impel is the most likely winner in this race. If it's not the two, the seven Impel should absolutely win this race off of her two races so far. She looks like the one. Brad Cox won this race with Monomoy Girl back a ways. She's not as credentialed as Monomoy Girl at this point, but she certainly has a ton of ability about her. So uh, Impel, one to watch in here. There was also some uh, comments from uh, Brad Cox about Impel on that Kentucky HBPA website uh, for uh, you on the YouTube page from Jenny Reese. So if you want more information on this race, I just thought it was more pertinent to get the Bill Mott interview to you, but there is some info on Impel uh, on that same website. So be sure to check that out uh, on the YouTube page for the Kentucky HBPA. Okay, our other handicappers across the way here for the big one. They've got Impel on top, three of the five. Helena's Forte, top choice in here uh, for Gabby Galdet. She'll get a decent price on that one as well. To the 10th and final we go, and as we go back and look at uh, our snapshot of the card, we got one more orange left there, folks, and, and hopefully this orange is juicy and sweet because we've got another key play. Turf pick three wraps up here. My third and final uh, uh, pick here uh, at a price is number 10, Redo, 15 to 1 in the morning line. I'm finishing with 30 to 1 and 15 to 1 in the final two races. You think you want to play a daily double, 210 to close things out at a 15% takeout? You might be uh, taking out your uh, your uh, meat in one aggressive swing right there uh, and, and making yourself a winner for the meat if we can get 210 home to finish things up here. But I like Redo coming out of some better races. I thought the competition was pretty good down uh, at Gulfstream where this one was running on the turf. Out of the 11 hole, two starts back, I thought that was a good race. The last one out in the synthetic is really hard to get a look at, but this horse continually outruns the odds. A tough post position, two starts back. It doesn't get much easier here, but when you got Ray Lou Gutierrez and John Ortiz teaming up, they teamed up five times at the Keeneland meet last year. They won two of them at some nice prices. I don't like the horses in here who are going to get bet. Number two, hidden presence. What are you going to do? Six starts, three seconds, three thirds. You've had a million chances to get it done. If this one wins, you just tip your cap and say, go on with it. Uh, Johnny V riding there for Graham Motion. Certainly a good post position, but I've got to try to beat that particular horse. Uh, Mozilla, the seven in here. Christophe Clement trains. This one coming off a mile and an eighth race down at Gulfstream Park. Got an easy pace that day. It doesn't get any easier than 49 and two, 114 and two, and still got caught on the end. So I respect the connections, but I don't think you have to play Missoula at any short price. I think you can find a decent price in this particular spot and go for it. Uh, Mont St. Mike a horse on the also eligible list. If that one draws in uh, from post 13, I think you definitely want to watch that one. Brendan Walsh, second time starter, just kind of even in the debut. It's going to be a wide and tough post from out there, but Walsh is really, you know, he's one of those guys. You talk about the trainers who could have a good meet who were off the radar. And I mentioned Cherie DeVoe and some of those late season trainers. Brendan Walsh 
isn't a name that like, rolls off the tongue, but he was really, really, really good here the last year or so uh, at Keeneland. He got off to an amazing start at the Gulfstream meet. If you start the, the, the championship meet at Gulfstream starting in December, he was rocking there for about a month or two. Uh, and then, you know, then he cooled off a little bit. So uh, let's see what he's got. Brendan Walsh, uh, another guy too. Brian Lynch was the same way. Brian Lynch down at Gulfstream was insanity, like in uh, December, January, the beginning of February. Now, did his barn cool off a little at the end of that meet? Maybe they're retooling back up. Brian Lynch might be a guy you want to see back here at Keeneland. His horse is cycling back with, uh, you know, with some time uh, off or, or, you know, aimed at Keeneland, maybe towards the end of that Gulfstream meet. Brian Lynch, Brendan Walsh, two other trainers uh, maybe that you want to consider in there. All right, we're about almost at the 50-minute mark. These usually go 30, 35, 40 minutes. A little bit longer today uh, being the first one of the season. We'll get in our groove and tighten it up a little bit for you uh, in future nights. Also, we don't have all the video and graphics and stuff uh, each and every night that we do uh, on this show with so many stakes races. But we're going to have a big show for you on Friday night for Saturday's card. Of course, Saturday's the big one with the uh, Toyota Bluegrass featured among five stakes races and all stakes pick five. I think uh, a phenomenal card uh, on Saturday. Uh, you can also get my stats and trends are already up on the website for Saturday. Uh, we've looked ahead at that card for you already. I've not even glanced at Sunday yet. Uh, that'll be my next order of business to get through this first three days of racing. But Friday and Saturday, picks and analysis are up there. Uh, we'll stay fluid, right? If we see something here on the Friday card that makes us want to change things up, uh, then we'll talk about it tomorrow night uh, as we preview that Saturday card. A last look at the picks. You can get all these selections at the Keeneland website in the Handicappers uh, Consensus section. You can get my stats and trends blog under the Expert Picks sections. Don't like to use the word expert for myself, but that's what they put on the website. That's where you find it uh, in the navigation. If you want to get some information from me, send to your email inbox. Be sure to join my sub stack. It's free. Uh, these are just emails that are sent to you. It'll give you handicapping information, notices when things are posted, uh, uh, some exclusive information. Uh, you don't have to go fishing around for stuff as much, and it'll end up in your email inbox. And if you're on part of my sub stack, then you also get information when it's not the Keeneland season or about uh, racing all around the country. Of course, my countdown to the crown season now in its 19th year. Uh, you can check that out at countdowntothecrown.com. And uh, the big weekend for the Triple Crown races, right? Saturday, we got the Bluegrass uh, here at uh, uh, Keeneland. We got the Santa Anita Derby. We got the Wood Memorial. Should be fantastic. A big three, pick three on Saturday. Give you a little advance on that. Those three Triple Crown prep races. Uh, we'll have a pick three wager. I believe 18% takeout, $3 minimum on that one. Uh, the big three, pick three is back this Saturday. So put that into your handicap and coffers as you look ahead to the weekend. First post is at 1 o'clock. Be sure to check out today at Keeneland at 1130 a.m. Eastern, where you get your first live look inside the track there at Keeneland each and every morning with Scott and Gabby as they get you set for the racing day. Weather going to be a big factor, whether you're watching this tonight or if you're checking out the archives tomorrow morning. It's going to be about updated conditions. Keep yourself uh, flexible. Uh, if it's a softer turf course, look for some horses that have some foreign experience and some foreign pedigrees. I always say handicap the parentheses. Horses have parentheses in their names. Usually have foreign breeding involved. That's usually a good sign for an off-turf course. Uh, and, of course, on wet tracks on the main track, a couple key factors. If we do get a wet track on Friday, you always want to look for front-end speed on wet tracks. Horses who have run well in the past on wet tracks and horses who have run poorly on wet tracks in the past, toss them out. Past form is always the most important thing. Second most important thing to me then is to look at whether or not those horses uh, have some early pace about them. And the last thing is pedigree because right now so much of the breeding, almost all these horses have some semblance of mud pedigree to them. So I'm not looking for anybody in terms of a pedigree play uh, on an off track. Maybe you've got some good horses you like in the pedigree and you want to share in the comments section uh, for an off track for some of the other fans. I'm going to wrap things up and call it a night here. Thanks for joining us on this Thursday edition of the Keeneland Look Ahead podcast for Ashland Stakes Day on Friday, the 6th of April. We'll be back again 830 Eastern on Friday night to preview Bluegrass Day. Have a great night, everybody. Take care.